So, John, one of the connections you've made with this kingdom-focused gospel, or the gospel of the kingdom, uh, would be from Matthew 5, 39. That's that you resist not evil. Um, sometimes we've called this term as Mennonites non-resistance, but, but, but you've made some objections to that term. Explain maybe why you dislike that term and what do you propose as an alternative? Well, it, Jesus did say don't resist evil, uh, but I noticed in most of the uh, tra translations, <clears throat> the newer translations at least, it says resist not an evil man. Because it tells us in the next verses how we're to relate to evil men. We're supposed to bless them, we're supposed to do good to them, we're supposed to love them. Uh, but what I see in the passage right after that, uh, do not resist evil men, I see resistance of evil. I, I, think, I think the term non-resistance has tended to make us think in passive terms. Uh, we just don't fight back, we, we, don't, we don't push back on anybody, we just, just hunker down and, and just are nice people and, and don't fight. Uh, but we are in a real battle. And the Bible says that uh, we are in a battle, but the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds and every high thing that exalteth itself against God. And so I, I think the term non-resistance tends to minimize the conflict, not defensive warfare, sorry, the offensive warfare that we are to be in against sin. And so I see those verses right after Jesus saying, don't resist evil men, I see a, 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 an interesting picture of a genuine resistance against evil that is, that is very different from what most people think. It's, we're under a different commander, different rules of engagement, different goals, different means of attaining those goals. So, a man slaps you on the uh, face, and uh, it says if he slaps you on the right cheek, now I'm gonna demonstrate this, I'm not gonna really hit you, uh, <laughs> but if I'm gonna hit you on the right cheek, it's gonna have to be this. It's a back slap, it's an insult. And you're not supposed to tell him, you're not supposed to say, now you hit me on the, uh, on the cheek. Okay. You're just supposed to turn it. Mm -hmm. Now he has to make a decision. He has to make a decision whether he's gonna slap you again. And that's gonna be different from what he was expecting. Mm -hmm. And that's gonna to start to do something in, inside of him uh, that, that's really going to challenge the evil that's in him. Or the person that says, now go this second mile. He wasn't expecting that. That, that. That's going to also be something that God can work with in his heart. It, it, this is gonna catch him totally off guard. He, he's not gonna have any kind of concept how you relate to that. Mm -hmm. Or if uh, he takes away your coat, and you say, here, you can have my cloak. Well, in the Old Testament, you weren't permitted to have a man's cloak, uh, overnight at least. Uh, you didn't give your cloak. It was taken as a pledge and had to be given back by evening. Mm -hmm. And so when you say, here, you can have my coat, cloak, just go, that's fine, you can have that too. That's gonna to be something different from what he was expecting. And uh, the person that tries to take advantage of you by uh, asking you for something, you say, well, yeah, uh, here, I have something to give you. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are, these are different roles of engagement. It's, it's actually fighting against evil on a different level. But still fighting is what you're saying. Yes. Still provoking, still agitating. It's the ideal resistance. The ideal resistance. <laughs> well, that's the term I think we're hunting that's for. That's the then. term, yes. Okay. So it's resistance, but it's ideal resistance and different from non-resistance in that it's just not just passiveness. Right. Okay. It's active. Mm -hmm. it, it's uh, Pastor Peter in the Emmental who they're taking the thatch off his roof. Mm -hmm. And he comes out and says, you guys have worked hard all night. You're hungry. My wife has a good breakfast for you. Come on in for breakfast. Mm -hmm. Don't we just call that passive aggressiveness? Uh, I call that the ideal resistance. <laughs> <laughs> How about nonviolent resistance, Martin Luther King Jr.? Uh, <laughs> yeah, now I think you're resisting evil men. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. I'm going to make that distinction. Uh -huh. uh, resisting evil men means you actually engage people in putting them down, and uh, yeah, I don't know how to describe it. But, uh, I'm putting you on the spot there, that's unfair. You are putting me on the spot on that one. <laughs> well, let me, uh, let me first of all read something here. Uh, <clears throat> the early church was, was really, really an active church. Uh, it wasn't passive by any means. Uh, <clears throat> Julian the Apostate, who tried to revive paganism in the fourth century, 
was really frustrated because these Christians were doing something that his pagan people were not doing. And I'm going to read what he says. These impious Galileans, the Christians, not only feed their own, but ours also. Welcoming them with their agape, they attract them as children are attracted with cakes. Whilst the pagan priests neglect the poor, the hated Galileans devote themselves to works of charity and by display of false compassion have established and given effect to their pernicious errors. Such practice is common among them and causes contempt for our gods. Because Christian charity was beneficial, this is a commentary on that, because Christian charity was beneficial to all, including pagans, imperial authority was weakened. So see, this, this was not just passive. They were out there. We often wonder why the early church had such tremendous influence on their society. They won the heart of the Roman Empire within 300 years. Mm -hmm. This hated sect that the Roman Empire tried by several desperate waves of persecution to completely obliterate before it ever got started, in 300 years found itself overtaken by it without lifting a sword. They won the heart of the Roman Empire by serving and by dying and by passive, not passive, by ideal resistance against evil and the uh, wrongs in their society. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you can just go down through history. Uh, the Anabaptists did something very similar. They were the first people in modern history to propose a free society, separation of church and state that had been together for a thousand years. Mm -hmm. They dared to challenge that and, and declare freedom of conscience and uh, voluntary church membership and adult baptism. Uh, they were actually were the pioneers of religious freedom. Nobody but nobody was talking about such freedom during the Reformation. But how did they win that battle? They won it at the stakes. They won it by, by persecution and suffering. And Peter has something to say about that too. Uh, he says, <clears throat> if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happier are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. It's in the, the suffering that this kind of resistance brings on, where the glory of God is shed abroad in a way that it isn't any other way. It's a little bit like Gideon's pictures, you know, when they smash those earthen pictures, which is sort of representative of our bodies. That's when the light shone forth. And so in this, this is a real battle. And people say, well, suppose you uh, do all of this and you still get killed. Well, it's a battle. There are casualties in battle, and people die. You have Dirk Willems. But my, oh my, I don't think Dirk Willems ever imagined the tremendous influence and the imagination he would fire in the hearts of people for the gospel by that act that he did. Mm -hmm. And so this, this is a battle, uh, and there is an ideal resistance, and it has results. I contend that the freedoms of Western civilization basically found their roots in Anabaptism. Now, we weren't political people, so you can't just trace it. But I, <clears throat> that's where it was introduced into the consciousness of society. And you said elsewhere that the, uh, the Pax Romana, or at least that claim of this, this Roman 200-year peace in time of prosperity, wasn't won so much by the power of Rome as by the willingness of Christians in ideal resistance. Could you unpack that? Well, uh, the, the Pax Romana, which when I was in public school, they said it was because of the strength of the Roman army. Nobody dared resist the Roman army. That's not really what was happening. Uh, that Pax Romana was coterminous with the 200 years, 300 years of peace mm -hmm. that the church had. For 200 years, the church refused to permit any fighting soldier to be a member of the church. And then in about A.D. 174, we have the first record of a, a fighting soldier joining the church. Mm -hmm. And that opened a horrible Pandora's box. Now we have Christians killing Muslims in Jerusalem. We have the Inquisition where Christians are torturing and burning other Christians at the stake. We have the conquest of the American Indian preached as, as uh, the will of God. We have blacks enslaved by Christians defended from the pulpit. We have the Latin America conquered under the sign of the cross. We have all the wars of Western civilization. There was a horrible Pandora's box that opened. But before that, the church had maintained its witness of peace. And I did not bring the quotes along, but you can read the quotes. They say that the reason for this Roman peace, the Christians, is because the king of peace has come. He's established the kingdom of peace. And it's the prayers of that kingdom that keeps the devil's activity in the world at bay. You think it would be a pretty displeasing thing to say to some provincial governor in Rome saying, 
So this piece that you guys think you're upholding, it's ours and it's for our king. Thank you very much. That's what they said. <laughs> <laughs> that, would, uh, that would probably make, uh, bring some reason for persecution down, I would assume. I'm not sure. You know, at the end of Isaiah 53, there's an interesting verse. It says, therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Now when you divide spoil, it's because you won a battle. But how did Jesus win it? He won it by dying. And that's the pattern he set for us. That, this, that there's a great victory to be won, but it will be won by suffering and by dying. So there's, there's the teaching of Jesus and say the beatitude, and then there's the actual embodiment of it in the gospel. And you're suggesting there that the gospel is actually, that's the form, that's the shape, that's the movement of the ideal and of our own resistance. But it's a pattern of winning. It is. Some people have called it reverse fighting. Uh-huh. <laughs> Where you die <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to win. Not the expected way to win. Yeah. No. yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it's history. That, that is seen in the early church. It's seen in Anabaptism. This isn't just theory. This actually has happened. You see some of the same thing with the Wesleys, who basically saved England from a bloody revolution. That's, that's acknowledged by historians by their preaching. And of course, if you read the story of the Wesley's preaching, they suffered a lot. They were mobbed and, and they had a lot of persecution. Uh, but they managed to, to get the gospel uh, into the hearts of people. And uh, what just about happened in England, which would have been similar to what happened in France, never happened. Well, let's talk history just a little bit. Um, you, you talk of the, the Anabaptists and I talk about the, the time period of the Reformation. Uh, how did the reformers grapple with this issue? Well, they, they believed that uh, the old covenant and the old laws of uh, the Old Testament were still in effect, and uh, they saw warfare as something legitimate to the Christian. They, they somehow overlooked that Jesus said, this is what used to be said, mm -hmm. but I say unto you. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, they just ignored the fact that Jesus was making a change. He said to Peter, Whenever Peter lopped off the high priest's ear, mm -hmm. he said, put your sword in its sheath. They that, all they that take the sword shall perish by the sword. And Tertullian said, when Jesus sheathed the sword of Peter, he sheathed the sword of every Christian. And Jesus also said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight. Mm -hmm. But his kingdom isn't of this world and his servants don't fight. They use different weapons, they use different rules of engagement, and they get different results. Yeah, and, and some of the history that can be easily overlooked, you've got that time period of the Reformation, a lot of freshness, a lot of newness, but that time period that's frequently neglected is what actually follows after that. When there's alliances formed, there's struggles of power, and there's all of this kind of posturing that goes on, and then there's just war, yeah. 30 years of it, the 30 years war, and following that, some people would point to the, the piece of Westphalia of saying, enough, like, this is... This is too much, you're, you're ripping Europe apart. There's huge swaths of, say, Germany that are just devastated. And uh, because of that, there has to be something of a wedge put between the church and the state. And that wedge has only grown since then, partly in the name of peace, yes. is that the church has been had to put to the sidelines of what politics is. Um, I just asked que this question get on the heels of, of what I just said. How do you, how do you work with the current contemporary context that we have in which if there was some kind of integration between church, state, and violence, which frequently happened, that integration is no longer there in a lot of Western societies where there's a separation that's been forcibly placed there between church and state. What is this gospel of the kingdom, and especially as you're talking about it, the ideal resistance, are there opportunities here? Well, I answered the number on the camp billboards. And the biggest question is, if God is all powerful and he's all loving, why he doesn't do something about all the suffering in the world? Hmm. And my answer to that is, he did. He sent Jesus to initiate a kingdom and it was to preach the gospel through the whole world. And if it had done that, and the gospel of peace that we're talking about had been part of that gospel, mm -hmm. I can visualize a world that's altogether different from the world we're living in. Mm -hmm. 
But what happens is the gospel gets taken to other countries without the, the ideal resistance concept. And so a whole bunch of people in those countries become Christians, and then a war breaks out, and these Christians all take up swords and kill, kill people. Hmm. And that's what happens when the gospel is preached without the gospel of peace. Rwanda was touted as the most Christian country in the world four years before the, the genocides occurred. It was touted as the most Christian country in the world. Four years later, the Hutus and the Tutsis basically tried to annihilate each other, and they were all professing Christians. That's what happens in our world whenever the gospel is, is preached without this ideal resistance and the teachings of Jesus and how to really resist evil is not taught. So still relevant? It is still relevant. Absolutely. Uh, back at the end of the 1700s, beginning of the 1800s, you had the Methodist circuit riding preachers. And Je there was a, a, one of them by the name of um, Jesse Lee. And Jesse Lee one night was preaching to a full house of people and they couldn't all get in. And so there were some boys sitting on the outside, outside the door. And uh, they created a major disturbance, almost disrupted the meeting. And Jesse Lee singled out one of them and very gently, uh, the, the man later admitted he was very kindly rebuked for the way he behaved. But it made him so angry. And he determined that before Jesse Lee left that night, he was going to whip him. But Jesse Lee somehow got away, and that didn't happen. Years later, when this man was a grown man, when the incident was practically forgotten and all the hatred in his heart had basically subsided, this man was in town one day, and he saw a, a a cart leaving uh, in front of him on the way home, on the trail. And he looked at it and he thought, that looks like Jesse Lee. So he pulled up beside him and he said, are you Jesse Lee? And he said, yes. He said, do you remember an incident? I think it was like 15 years before. You remember this incident? And Jesse Lee said, yes, I remember. And he said, well, I determined that night I was going to whip you. And he said, I'm going to do that now. And Jesse Lee said, well, I'm an old man. And if I decided to fight you, you would win. Besides, the Bible says that the man of God is not supposed to strive. So that would not be the thing to do anyway. So if you just give me time to get down off this cart to the middle of the road, you can whip me as long as you want to. And the young man said, a terror gripped him. A horrible... A uh, feeling gripped him, and he said, I got on my horse, and I rode away from that scene as fast as I could go. That's the power of this ideal resistance. Mm -hmm. Something genuine happened there mm -hmm. in that man's heart. Now, it won't always work that way, uh, because, uh, like I said, we're in a battle. Although, you know, you ask our, 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 uh, non our, our people who believe in ideal resistance what they would do if somebody attacked their family. I don't know what most people would say, but I'll tell you what one couple did when they were attacked. They were in a motel, and uh, they were in the city of Atlanta, and there were a couple thugs loose in the city, and there had been a couple murders, and uh, the, the city authorities said, uh, keep your doors shut, keep them locked, be suspicious of strangers, because there are these two murderers loose in the city. Well, this couple was a missionary couple, and they were just visitors there in a motel, and they were expecting friends to come in, and so they just left their door open so the friends could walk in. They never heard the warning. And then walked these two murderers. Well, what would you have done? They told them to get to the floor, and the pattern was they, then they would shoot their victims once they were on the floor. Uh, the man did that, but his wife was sitting on the edge of the bed and she got up and she walked straight toward them singing a gospel song, and they fled. Now that won't always happen, but that's one of our weapons. The Bible says God inhabits the praises of Israel. I would like for every family that's practicing ideal resistance to think, not just pray when, when they're attacked, but start singing. That's the best way to bring God's presence into the situation. And so there, there, I'm just giving that as an example. There are weapons, there are means by which we can appropriate God's special power and grace in those situations. Mm -hmm. uh, and besides, uh, when we're talking about being attacked personally, uh, you know, there have been police studies done as to what kind of methods will give you the best chances of survival if you're ever attacked or your family's attacked. 
because they're always interested in knowing what is the best way for police to handle these situations. And the research shows that if you're armed, you stand less chance of surviving than if you're not armed. I mean, so this is realism. This isn't just idealism. See, everybody assumes that if you have a weapon and, and you defend your family that you will succeed. That's not to be, that's not to be concluded, because many people take that approach and die. And uh, the police studies actually show that, that your chances, if anything, are a bit better if you don't meet violence with violence. Mm -hmm. So Jesus' teaching here is very realistic. Mm -hmm. And even uh, realistic in the sense, too, that if, if a person would die in that situation, they're practicing ideal resistance. If that is actually something at the heart of the gospel, you're just working with the pattern of the universe. That's Absolutely. the structuring principle. And to die in the structure of the universe in that way, it sounds like resurrection to me. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, one final question here. Um, you could probably talk about this for a while, but it seems to me that uh, these, these ideas of non-resistance, of ideal resistance, they're, they're very much part of the Anabaptist heritage, and you've already yes. identified that too. Um, what would you say to those people who are currently maybe in the Anabaptist tradition in some way or another and are considering leaving as it uh, connects to this heritage of non-resistance, ideal resistance? Well, that's a great perplexity to me. I often say to them, what did you do with non-resistance? I had an uncle who married uh, an evangelical and left the Anabaptist churches, actually helped establish an evangelical church in his city, a very religious man. And I said to him, I said, uncle, what did you do with non-resistance? Oh, I'm still non-resistant. Mm -hmm. But his children aren't. And I, I don't understand that. I mean, to me, we're not talking about whether you wear hooks and eyes or where you part your hair. We're talking about whether you condone the killing of people. Mm -hmm. And so this is a great perplexity to me. I do want to back up. There's something I did forget to say. I wanted to read, I didn't think I had this here, but I do, the testimony of the early Christians to the government. Mm -hmm. This is Origen. Our prayers defeat all demons who stir up war. He's writing to the emperor, okay? Those demons also lead persons to violate their oaths and to disturb the peace. Accordingly, in this way, we are much more helpful to the kings than those who go to, into the field to fight for them. And we do take our part in public affairs when we join self-denying exercises to our righteous prayers, that's those deeds of mercy that we were talking about, and meditations, which teach us to despise pleasures and not to be led away by them. So none fight better for the king than we do. Indeed, we do not fight under him even if he demands it, yet we fight on his behalf, forming a special army, an army of godliness by offering our prayers to God. <laughs> <laughs> it's just amazing. Uh, and it goes on to say, and if he would have us lead armies in defense of our country, let him know that we do this too. And we do not do it for the purpose of being seen of men or for vainglory, for in secret, in other words, he's saying in secret, we do have an army that we're leading. In secret and in our hearts, our prayers ascend on behalf of our fellow citizens as from priests. So Christians are benefactors of their country more than others. <laughs> more than the legionary. Yes. You know. <laughs> I mean, this is amazing. Now, if you ask uh, most people who don't follow this path about this historical uh, fact that the Christians did not fight for the first two centuries, they say, well, in the Roman army, uh, they were especially pressured to uh, worship Caesar like they wouldn't have been if they wouldn't have been in the army. They had to regularly do this. So that's why they weren't in the army. But that's not what the early Christians said. That's, that's, uh, they, said they said the reason they weren't there is because they were in a different kingdom and they were fighting, a different battle, uh, fighting the battle in a different way. Still a battle, but different means, different weapons. That's why I say ideal resistance. Mm -hmm. I want all of us to realize that we're not supposed to just passively sit by and see evil take place. I mean, if I had lived in Hitler's Germany, I certainly wouldn't have joined any resistance against him with carnal weapons. But I think I'd have been trying to think creatively how I could resist that evil. And of course, many people did. They risked their lives to, to save these uh, people who were threatened and you know, put their lives at great risk, and some of them lost their lives. Uh, and, and so I, I think that's the kind of thing we think about. How can we resist this evil 
and still not be resisting men, but still blessing them, doing good to them, praying for them, and showing love to them, and yet resisting the evil. Would you like to say anything more yet about um, people who are considering leaving or jettisoning the heritage of non-ideal resistance? Now, every culture is rooted in its values. If you go to India, you'll see a culture there, and if you start to talk to them, you'll find that there were values that those, those cultural practices were the expression of. And that was true for us too. So now I'm looking, and churches are wringing their hands. Why do we have so much individualism? Why do we have so much self-expression? Why do we have so much disunity? Why do we have so much self-will? Yeah, we discarded the practices, and then the values disappear. We, we cannot delude ourselves into thinking that we can have values that really have no distinct expression. So are you uh, suggesting there's a two-way relationship? There is. Values, practices? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that we could not have improved on some of those practices. Sure. In fact, some of them we certainly could. But to just simply say, we don't need those anymore. Mm -hmm. We really don't need any cultural expressions. Mm -hmm. That's denying the fact that God made us cultural people go all over the world and every culture develops, or really every culture are practices that grow out of the values of, the, of those societies. Mm -hmm. And Christianity will produce a culture. Mm -hmm. It's like Finney said this morning, it'll be something you can see, it's something tangible. It's the way the people talk, it's the way they look, it's the decisions they make, the places they go, the clothes they wear, the way they do their hair. There's gonna be a culture. Mm -hmm. So if we're gonna deny culture, we can just basically scrap the values that uh, we as Anabaptists have stood for. So there's, there's this one connection here I've got to call out, and that's that you've, you've talked about culture, and you've also talked about ideal resistance. Um, I think what I hear you saying is that the ideal for the values of ideal resistance actually begin to form some kinds of cultural yes. expressions. Could you talk about those a little bit? No, I am unprepared for this one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's hardball. <laughs> I, I'm trying to think okay. what, what the culture expression of the ideal resistance is. Well, and you, you, you've made one already. This, this idea of Galassenheit or yieldedness yes. would have quickly become something of an expression yes, of that. Yes, Well, I would say our whole culture of, of not, not having lawsuits against people, hmm. Hmm. not pressing charges against people when we're wronged, mm -hmm. uh, uh, returning good for evil. I mean, we do teach that, and, and there, is, uh, there is practice of that. But as far as any cultural expressions, I can't just now think of any of that particular aspect of our belief. If nothing else, are the cultural practices and norms that are there of, say, non-retaliation through lawsuit, incredibly valuable. Yes, it is. And of course, we've always been known, we will not uh, go into combat. I mean, th those, those are cultural practices. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the call I hear you giving is don't too quickly despise or reject those. They're important. They're actually influential in shaping a person, maybe especially children. Well, on this one, I will say this. If we are going to allow ourselves to become acculturated in our society, mm -hmm. it's going to be much, much harder for us to maintain an ideal, of resi an ideal resistance mm -hmm. because we've shied away from the whole idea of having a distinctive culture. Mm -hmm. And so if, if the rest of our culture has become uh, merged with the culture around us, then this one's going to disappear too. I will say that. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Okay, well John, thank you for joining us. It's a uh, talk about ideal resistance. Those that try to hang on to their lives, they're going to lose them. Those that surrender and give their lives, these are the ones that you expect to bear much fruit and to gain eternal life. Thanks again, John. And I would just like to say, it's all about the kingdom. Amen. It's not about getting to heaven. It's about getting heaven to earth. Mm, very good. It's here and now. Thank you, John. God bless you.